Hi, Wendy. How are you? Hey. How are you, Hi, Wendy? Wendy. <laughs> Is Good afternoon, um, and uh, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Wilson Center, and it's my pleasure today uh, for, for the Center to host this Director's Forum with Michael Zantowski, former Czech Ambassador to the United States and the current Czech Ambassador to the United Kingdom. Um, the Wilson Center is a public-private institution created by an act of Congress and it serves as the official national memorial to uh, our 28th president. Uh, we tackle global issues through independent research, open dialogue, and actionable ideas. We seek to provide safe political space for addressing key public policy issues. The Wilson Center is delighted once again to co-host the Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture, which commemorates the inspiring struggle for freedom by the Czech and Slovak peoples. This lecture series is sponsored by American Friends of the Czech Republic and Friends of Slovakia, and by the Embassy of the Czech Republic um, and, uh, and the Embassy of Slovakia. I would like to recognize and thank the Ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States, uh, Peter Gondolovich, as well as the Ambassador of Slovakia to the United States, uh, Peter Kmec, uh, who are with us today. I am also pleased to welcome Ted Russell, the former uh, United States Ambassador to Slovakia and founding chairman of Friends of Slovakia. And uh, I don't know, is the current chairman of the Friends of Slovakia, Joe Senko, with us? That is the order of the day. Uh, but we do have the vice president and pr uh, vice chairman and pr uh, president of the Friends of Slovakia, Bill Tucker, with us as well as uh, Tom Dine, the former president of Voice of, uh, of America and the current Radio Free Europe. Thank you. I was, I was wondering about that. I was told Voice of America. Radio Free Europe and the current president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic. Thanks, uh, thank you and for all the work that all of you do in support of this program. Over the last 13 years, this lecture series has uh, given the Wilson Center and its uh, global uh, Europe program the privilege of hosting, uh, among others, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, the solidarity leader and prominent newspaper editor, uh, editor uh, Adnan Mishnik, uh, uh, Mihnik, uh, as well as a former Czech President uh, Václav Klaus. Ambassador Zantowski is no stranger in this town and his career has been extraordinary. In 1989, he became a founding member of the Czech uh, chapter of PEN, P -E -N, the international organization of writers and translators banned in Czechoslovakia during the communist era. Subsequently, he co-founded the Civic Forum, an umbrella organization uh, that coordinated the overthrow of the communist regime and the peaceful transfer of power during the Velvet Revolution. Later, he worked as press secretary and spokesman for President Václav Havel, as well as uh, political director of the president's office. Following the, uh, this appointment, um, Ambassador Zantowski, ser um, Zantowski uh, served as the Czech and then the Slovak ambassador to the United States until 1997. In the late 90s, he returned to the Czech Republic, where he was elected to, as a member of the Senate and served as chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Security, in addition to being elected uh, president of the Civic Democratic Alliance, a parliamentary political party. In 2003, he co-founded the Prague-based think tank program of um, Atlantic Security Issues, PASS, and served of its, as its first executive director. Upon completion of his term in the Senate, 
uh, Ambassador Zuntowski returned to the Foreign Service. He served as Ambassador of the Czech Republic to Israel from 2003 to 2009 when he was appointed um, uh, the Ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United Kingdom where he's been for the last four years. As a writer, teacher, and translator, Ambassador Zontovsky has continued to pursue his interests in, uh, in foreign policy and political theory. His translations include works by Henry Kissinger, Joshua Moravchik, and Madeleine Albright. He has taught American studies at Charles University in Prague and uh, Euro-American relations at the Prague branch of the uh, New York University. Currently, the ambassador, in whatever spare time he has with uh, two growing kids, um, is writing a biography of President Václav Havel. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Ambassador Zontovsky. Uh, Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for this uh, all too generous uh, introduction. I must have, I must make uh, just one disclaimer. I was never a Slovak ambassador to uh, the United States. I came here at the end of 1992 as the Czechoslovak ambassador uh, to the United States, and three months later I was demoted to the Czech <laughs> ambassador. <laughs> and, uh, 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 well, uh, Your Excellencies, colleagues, my fellow Czechs, uh, my cousin Slovaks, and ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply honored by the opportunity to deliver the annual Freedom Lecture of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, all the more for the fact that I happened to stand as a kind of a midwife at uh, the base of this distinguished organization we were discussing that last night over a very pleasant dinner. Uh, I would also like to compliment the American friends and your sister group, Friends of Slovakia, on everything you have done over the last two decades to help our two nations build a strong relationship with this country, the United States of America. And finally, for hosting this event, I would like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center, one of the great institutions of civil society in the United States, named after a president who at the end of the First World War stood also as a kind of a midwife at the base of Czechoslovakia. Uh, but uh, I think I had better stop talking about bears and midwives and get to my subject, <laughs> uh, lest this gathering appears to be some kind of an obstetrics convention. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sure it has occurred to everyone at least once in his or her life what a wonderful thing it would be to win the jackpot in a lottery. And many of us have indeed bought a lottery ticket at least once in their lives only to validate the well-known fact that the chances of winning in a lottery are rather small. Some of us, however, may have not put up with this sober conclusion and proceeded on the assumption that if they bought two lottery tickets, their chances of winning the jackpot will increase twofold, and then they may be extrapolated the logic to three, five, or even ten tickets. And a few of us might have even entertained the theoretical possibility that if we bought all the tickets to a lottery, <laughs> we would be assured of winning the jackpot. Well, there is nothing wrong with dreaming of a stroke of luck and trying to maximize one's chances, but it also pays to use common sense and elementary knowledge of the probability calculus. A more thorough analysis will immediately tell us that while our chances of losing money when buying one lottery ticket are very high, our chances of losing money when buying two, three, or five lottery tickets are that much higher, and that buying all the lottery tickets will not only give us an absolute certainty of winning the jackpot, but also an absolute certainty of losing vast amounts of money in the process. But what, you might ask, does buying a lottery ticket have to do with freedom? Freedom, after all, is arguably not an outcome of a random process like winning in a lottery. It is a conscious choice based on the belief that men are born with certain inalienable rights and should be thus free to make decisions about their lives. 
It is based on this belief that we build the institutions of a free society, provide them with the necessary checks and balances, and guarantee the rule of law to prevent arbitrary punishment and attempts to hijack our freedom. For all the problems of a free society, we believe with Winston Churchill that democracy, the political system that embodies, maintains, and administers a free society is vastly preferable to all the alternatives. To a degree, we believe that we have hit the jackpot in the lottery of political systems. All too often, however, the pride and the comfort of living in a free society lures us into underestimating dangers it is exposed to and into taking freedom for granted. We are more alert to these threats when they take an overt and brutal form, such as a hostile power or terrorist attacks against people, institutions, and infrastructure. It is clear to us that such attacks are masterminded by people who do not approve of or even hate our way of life and would like to replace it with a secular tyranny or with an allegedly divine rule. Although such attacks could and did cause us immense harm and suffering in the past, not least in this country, we believe our societies are strong enough and our liberties robust enough to withstand them. We are, alas, not nearly as vigilant when confronted with political systems which pay a lip service to freedom and democracy and do not act overtly hostile to us, but which claim exceptions on the grounds of culture, tradition, religion, or state of development and deny the universal character of freedom and human rights. The question, I hasten to add, is not trying to impose our standards on such societies that would be rightly seen as cultural imperialism. The question is whether by acknowledging their claims and making allowances in the interest of international cooperation, commercial advantage, or the accommodation of large numbers of migrants from such societies into our own, we do not often unwittingly relax our own standards as well. More seriously still, we seem to be the least aware of and the most tolerant of the threats to free society that come not from the outside, from its enemies, but from within our own ranks. And by this I do not mean dangers stemming from radical groups hellbent on bringing about a utopia of some kind, though they too exist, but rather those from people who are happy to share in the benefits of freedom and are proud of its accomplishments, people like you and me. Every day, we witness all around us the tireless activity of individuals, groups, and politicians who far from deliberately trying to subvert freedom are trying to improve upon it a little here or there. Just like the person who buys another lottery ticket strives to improve his chances of winning. The flaw they are trying to fix in one way or another is exactly the degree of uncertainty in the system. Voters in particular abhor uncertainty and crave security, voters everywhere. So to improve our job security, for example, admittedly a valuable consideration for any individual, we will introduce more safeguards for the employees, making them less prone to dismissal, and in case such safeguards fail, we will have a comfortable cushion of unemployment benefits in place. We will prefer to disregard the fact that such measures will drive the cost of labor up, perhaps to the extent of becoming uncompetitive with other markets, with the consequent rise of unemployment and the decrease of job security as a result. Or to fight crime and terrorism, we will increase the surveillance over our cities, our citizens and their communications, perhaps to the extent of decreasing our own perceived level of personal privacy. To prevent a catastrophic epidemics which might never materialize, we mobilize our public health care systems and immunize millions of people at an enormous cost without a perceptible benefit to our collective health. And to offset the specter of catastrophic global warming, we engage in preemptive policies which might at best make a marginal difference in return for a monstrous investment. 
I could go on, but I'm sure that you have all witnessed similar strategies in your own experience. Another somewhat less altruistic internal threat to a free society comes from people who exploit the rules of the system to make sure their number always comes up in the lottery. Rather than taking their chances on the open market, they will make use of the fact that in a typical European country, about one half of all wealth, 50% of the GDP, gets redistributed through public budgets. And by means of their contacts, influence, and not infrequently overt corruption, they make sure they will be at the receiving end of a significant portion of that wealth. At its extreme, such economic system, in a phrase attributed to Milton Friedman, constitutes socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. There is no underestimating the damage that corruption causes to freedom. More than two centuries ago, its mortal danger to a free society was recognized by the conservative philosopher and politician Edmund Burke. And I will quote, Corrupt influence is itself the perennial spring of all prodigality and of all disorder. It loads us more than millions of debt, takes away vigor from our arms, wisdom from our counsels, and every shadow of authority and credit from the most venerable parts of our constitution. Among a people generally corrupt, liberty cannot long exist." End of quote. And finally, freedom may be threatened, albeit unintentionally, by the actions of the very government we elect to guarantee and safeguard our liberties. I represent a government that since its inception and even before then has considered human rights and their protection as one of the fundamental values of any society. It is, however, increasingly a question whether freedom and human rights are best served by judicial policies that makes us defenseless in dealing with terrorists, criminals, and human traffickers, just as it is a question whether the cause of freedom will have been advanced by suspending human rights guarantees for certain categories of individuals. As Václav Havel wrote 40 years ago in his play, The Conspirators, I quote, it is a natural disadvantage of democracy that it ties the hands of those who wish it well and opens unlimited possibilities for those who do not take it seriously." Unquote. In an effort to protect our liberty, our rights, our prosperity, our health, and our security, our governments, especially those in Europe that I'm the most familiar with, excel at inventing ever new regulations that stipulate how things should be done and even more how they should not be done and dictate how many hours a week we are allowed to work, how long we have to sleep, wh what we can eat and cannot eat, which substances are beneficial to us and which are harmful, etc., etc. The increasing volume of regulations makes us safer against the number of risks, real or alleged, but also comes at an enormous cost to our societies and our economies and makes us increasingly uncompetitive with respect to other societies not so burdened. If this trend continues, we Europeans are running the risk of becoming exceedingly safe, but also pretty much useless. We might end up being not so different from the Amish people, insistent on preserving our quaint mores, strictures, and costumes and living in constant fear of violating an endless number of prescriptions and prohibitions whose origin and wisdom we are not allowed to question. Well, I am sure you all understand where I'm heading with this. I'm not trying to deny the importance of a basic social security net for the well-being and harmony in a society. And neither am I trying to deny that climate changes occur, that they are attributable to human activity, and that something should be done about it. And I'm not denying that the complexity of a modern society requires a degree of regulation that might have been unnecessary in earlier times. What I'm driving at is simply the observation that freedom is not a state of grace, the end of history, that is granted to us who are lucky enough to live in it, but rather a dynamic equilibrium 
comparable to the modern inherently unstable fighter jets, which trade off stability for maneuverability and are constantly bordering on a state of stall, prevented from falling only by the infinite number of minor corrections which keep them airborne. Likewise, the greatest and quite unique strength of the democratic system of government is its self-corrective capability, its capacity to learn from its past mistakes and possibly to avoid them the next time. But take away that capa capability, let considerations of welfare, security, political correctness or profit outweigh those of the liberties of the people and freedom will decay and wither away as it did in a number of places a number of times in the past. Which brings me from the uncertainty of freedom to the second part of my remarks, the freedom of uncertainty. Statistics, one of the most pedestrian of scientific disciplines, <laughs> operates with what is in my mind one of the more poetic metaphors in the history of human thought. It is called degrees of freedom. And it is defined as a number of variables or parameters in a system that may vary independently. In its essence, it expresses the degree of uncertainty we are able or willing to cope with in conducting a scientific experiment or analyzing empirical data. Taken metaphorically, it expresses the intrinsic link between freedom and uncertainty. The more parameters we are able to vary, the greater the uncertainty about the outcome of our experiment. If we apply this model to the area of human conduct, it becomes clear that uncertainty is not just a side effect, an unavoidable drawback to human liberty, a price we have to pay for being free, but it's necessary condition. It is not freedom that gives rise to uncertainty as its enemies would like us to believe, but rather uncertainty that gives rise to freedom. In the winter of 1968-69, a few months after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, there occurred one of those occasional grand debates of Czech intellectual life that have often occupied a disproportionately large space in our political history, more so than comings and goings of kings and presidents, decisions of the government or military campaigns. Milan Kundera, already on his way to become one of the best known Czech and European writers of the second part of the 20th century, wrote an essay called The Czech Destiny, in which he attempted to cement the relatively meager accomplishments of the Prague Springs in the few months it had been allowed to exist before the invasion by pointing to the allegedly unique and lasting significance of the effort to build socialism with a human face, thus creating a legacy that, I will quote, placed Czechs and Slovaks in the center of world history, unquote. In Kundera's mind, it was the destiny of a small nation in the middle of Europe, surrounded by big and often aggressive neighbors, to shine as a beacon of light for other nations, even if it was itself destined to live forever under the cloud of oppression and tyranny. Coming as it did just before Christmas 1968, the essay offered a soothing balm on the fresh and festering wounds of the nation. To many people, it thus came as a shock when Kundera's argument was resolutely rejected and months later in an essay written by his younger colleague and friend, the playwright Václav Havel, who rejected Kundera's claims to the exclusivity and the lasting appeal of the Prague Spring. In Havel's mind, the reform movement largely aspired to goals like freedom of expression, freedom of association, and other political and economic freedoms that much of the rest of the world took for self-evident. At the same time, though, he denied there was anything immutable about the national history of suffering under the yoke of more powerful neighbors. And Havel wrote, I quote, whenever the Czech patriot lacks the courage to face a cruel but open-ended present to admit all its aspects and to draw mercilessly the necessary conclusions, even should they be aimed into our own ranks, he will turn to a better but already definitive past, wrote Havel 
choosing uncertainty over security. And by going on to write, our destiny depends on us, the world does not consist of dumb superpowers that can do anything and clever small nations that can do nothing, Havel shattered the myth of Czech intellectual superiority and physical impotence in the anticipation of the day 20 years later when the nation would be free to, cho to choose its own destiny, which would not be that of the Prague Spring either. In his writings, Havel keeps coming back to this idea of uncertainty as a precondition of freedom. In his thinking, which owes much to the influences of Martin Heidegger and existentialist philosophers, this uncertainty is an essential part of the condition of modern man, his manifest destiny. It is not so much that the modern man chooses freedom as that he is thrown into freedom, condemned to it. True, uncertainty has been a part and parcel of human existence since times immemorial. What makes modernity distinct from previous eras, though, is the wholesale recognition of this fact and the withering away of concepts that provided a semblance of certainty to our ancestors, whether they were the ironclad operation of the laws of nature or the absolute authority of a divine presence. Without God, everything is permitted, is the famous quote from Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, which is sometimes translated, if God is dead, everything is permitted, and that's, that's not a correct translation because Dostoevsky himself was a religious man. The inseparable link between freedom and uncertainty is at the bottom of the undeniable duality of freedom and of the anguish that it often produces. By being free, we are not only liberated from the shackles of tyranny, dogma, and prejudice, but we are also expelled from the stifling but familiar edifice of regulated life into a vast foreign and unknown universe in which we can use our newfound powers to do harm just as well as to do good. Without guidelines, such life may become just an exercise in absurdity, void of any meaningful goals except those which we are endowed by nature, that is survival, personal comfort, and reproduction. This in turn creates the feeling of emptiness, alienation, and insecurity, even despair, that leads so many people to turn to false prophets, esoteric swords, and populist demagogues for salvation. It is a vicious circle in which freedom becomes a threat to itself. Martin Heidegger said of this existential quandary in a quote often referred to by Václav Havel, only a God can save us now. But wouldn't such salvation come at the price of freedom itself? The key to this dilemma may lie in nothing more than the choice of the grammatical article. In German, the above quoted sentence of Heidegger reads, nur noch ein Gott kann uns retten, only some God, only a God can save us now, with the clear implication that there is an element of human choice in the matter of salvation. If he can offer a single certainty, some God, in the face of the vast uncertainty which spawns the world of freedom, then we can perhaps embrace freedom without the fear of falling into an abyss. There is more than one name for the kind of God I have in mind, but they all come down to self-limitation. Just as a government of a free society is by definition a limited government, a free man can and should impose limits on his own conduct of his own volition. You can call it morality, you can call it responsibility, or you can call it humility. It is inseparable from the history of human conduct in all societies, albeit as often in breach as in observance. The prohibitions against killing another human being, stealing their property, lying and cheating against imposing arbitrary power of the powerless, the commandments to provide for those closest to you and help your fellow man, the stern warnings against pride and hubris, seem to be universal to the most diverse societies in spite of considerable definitional, definitional differences 
about what constitutes such a prohibited act. We can argue whether such moral strictures are God-given as all religions believe, whether they are biologically rooted and came into being as a result of evolutionary pressures, as the sociobiologists would claim, or whether they are man-made as a way to organize a society and protect its stability, as the institutionalists among us would argue, but we cannot deny the importance. And another quote, no society, no matter how technologically advanced, can function without a moral basis, a conviction which is not a matter of opportunity, circumstances, or anticipated benefits. However, morality is not here for the society to function, but simply because it makes a human being human. Wrote Jan Patochka in his essay on the duty to resist injustice and the circumstances that led directly to his death following the launch of Charter 77. This does not mean reintroducing constraints of the God-ordained universe <coughs> through the back door. But if we are free to choose our God, then perhaps we are also free to choose our morality or to our detriment, the lack thereof. I'm not claiming that embracing responsibility, showing humility, and putting a renewed emphasis on the moral roots of all human conduct all things that you will recognize as not my original recipe, but as something advocated by our great countrymen, Václav Havel, Thomas Garrick Masaryk, and a long line of thinkers before them, would repair everything that is wrong with the current state of the Western society, while simultaneously protecting the liberties we all hold dear. But I'm confident in thinking that without such emphasis, the great edifice of liberty, nowhere more in evidence than in this great capital of a great nation, might be at risk. We cannot guarantee that everyone wins in a lottery. But if we are wise enough, responsible enough, and moral enough, we can make sure that the lottery will be there for him or her to play the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zantowski. Um, I open the floor. Uh, there is a microphone uh, that we'll have on either side. And uh, identify yourself and no speeches. Ask a question. <laughs> uh, the floor is open. Um, you talked uh, in there about uh, self-limitations. Um, would you uh, say a word about uh, the issue of uh, corruption, which we hear about in parts of um, Central and Eastern Europe, and how that should be handled? Well, uh, corruption in Central and Eastern Europe is, is certainly an issue. Uh, it seems to be endemic to uh, all the societies in the region. It uh, obviously has uh, to do with the uh, uh, relative uh, uh, use of the political systems in the region with the massive transformation that uh, uh, have uh, taken place. And... Uh, it's uh, it's a in my mind it's a huge problem, but that said, I I don't think it's the best perspective to view the problem as uh, exclusive or, or limited to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we all remember that. Uh, how the corruption started in in the countries of the region and uh, certainly from the communist days we have uh, inherited uh, a degree of uh, uh, corruption 
in the society, but it was mostly, you know, petty corruption. Uh, you know, you uh, brought someone a bottle to get a building permit or, or something, or to, to get ahead of the line at the doctor's office, but that was, that was largely that. The big time corruption, you know, started with the economic changes, and I regret to say have been for part of it imported. You know, there were big uh, Western European countries at the time where you could tax deduct uh, bribes paid in uh, Czechoslovakia or, or, or other countries as an expenditure. And, uh, and uh, it took years before, you know, the countries in question became aware of the problem, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it was made bigger by the fact that this was the only source of big money at the time. I mean, there was no big money in uh, indigenous in the, in the countries themselves. So I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a more general problem. It's still a general problem. It's uh, you find uh, aspects of it in uh, not in the new, not just in the new democracies of Central and Eastern Europe, but in uh, Greece, in Italy, in Spain, uh, and I could go on and on. And I didn't want to single out these three countries because that would be unfair. I mean, it's everywhere. It's uh, more serious in some countries, less serious. In others, there are uh, more effective uh, anti-corruption policies uh, in place in some countries, less effective in others. Uh, but uh, I think it it pays to 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 look at it in in each and every country. Yes, sir. Uh, Zed, um, down here in the second row, and then the next question will be in the third row at the edge. Zed, you go. Zdenek David, uh, I'm a senior scholar here. <coughs> I noticed your stress on the proliferation of regulations concerning very minute activities and so on. It sort of reminds me of criticism of <coughs> European Union, the Brussels dictation and so on. So I wondered what you think of uh, you know the future of the Union and perhaps also as a side issue why it was that Czechoslovakia through Václav Klaus became such a prominent Eurosceptic uh, voice. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm I'm not a Eurosceptic myself. I I try to remain a Eurorealist, and uh, and and I think that it's fair to say that the general view uh, of the European Union by citizens, uh, NGOs, people who made it their business and their profession to think about uh, these issues is, is different today from uh, what it was five years ago. Uh, Europe has undergone a crisis. Uh, uh, for most part, it was a financial and debt crisis, and it has just uh, uh, it's just coming out of it uh, recently. But uh, the crisis revealed that there are some structural deficiencies in the way uh, uh, Europe works and in uh, the way it compares uh, to the rest of the world. And, uh, and these problems have not been resolved yet. I mean, we are we may be back to sluggish growth, but in terms of competitiveness with other parts uh, of uh, the world, with the new emerging economies, with uh, the BRICS and and uh, and and you name it, is still very unfavorable to Europe, and and there needs to be, in my mind, a a, a big debate whether the way to overcome these issues is uh, is deeper uh, integration and more regulation as some countries uh, would propose i would not 
or maybe more emphasis on the principle of subsidiarity which is uh, one of the uh, one of the pillars of european integration not uh, very well used in the in the past and allow for uh, more competition between the member countries for uh, a, a more uh, specific uh, mm, for more specific ways to solve the problems in individual countries rather than try to find one solution for uh, for every every country of 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 the union and uh, and i think you know the next two three years will will have to be uh, will have to bring some kind of uh, resolution of this debate otherwise i'm afraid that uh, that what i said uh, half seriously about the amish people might uh, come true <laughs> third row over here thank you my name is dick schubert and i'm privileged to be involved in uh, american friends of the czech republic the concept is certainly, and Mr. Ambassador, is very, very attractive of self-limitations. It seems to me, however, that that requires that the culture uh, and the educational framework of society begins with our small children and encourages those self-limitations. Because if the majority of any population is not self-limited, then there certainly will be abuses which will then require the regulations that you've also talked about. So don't we end up with the notion that in the family and in the schools, we really encourage self-limitation in order for this to work? Well, you know, I will be, thank you, that's an interesting question, and I will be talking a bit out of school here. Uh, I have a small sample of this problem at home. I have uh, two uh, uh, growing up uh, children, 10 and 12, uh, and my wife and I are trying to do our best to uh, uh, teach them some self-limitation. Uh, the problem is uh, they go to school <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, and because of our past uh, uh, posting in Israel, they do not go to a British school in London, they go to the American school in uh, London. And so, uh, so most of the uh, fellow students are, are Americans and many of uh, the Americans, I'm afraid, are not uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, trained to self uh, limitations as as our two kids are and sometimes our kids uh, protest against the tyranny at home that uh, <laughs> you know we are imposing on them and and demand uh, less uh, uh, limitation you know i think we have another 3 or 4 years to conduct this war and we will see how it uh, how it turns <laughs> out <laughs> Uh, Wendy Lures down here. Michael, um, as one of your oldest friends, or you being the very first real Czech that we ever met in Prague in 1983, um, as you know, probably uh, about one percent of the voters in, Czechos in the Czech Republic or in Slovakia today would, would probably embrace um, or really spend the time thinking about what your brilliant um, lecture just talked about because they're all trying to extrapolate into their own self-interest um, as they go along and that self-interest in Hungary has been seen to create a situation which is very difficult. I recognize you're a sitting ambassador. You're not allowed to criticize any other country. But I'd like to see um, a as the chairman of Aspen Prague and going back to Prague what are some of the issues that you've drawn from your experience in the United States, in Tel Aviv, and now in, in Europe that you would take back to the, the populace of, of, of the Czechs that would somehow allow them to have the kind of depth of thinking that you all had before 1989 and then turn it into something practical that will be for the benefit of the country? 
And this would apply to Slovakia as well, I'm sure. Wendy, that's a big question. I know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me try have a go at it. Uh, you know, one thing that is, uh, that has become a problem in, in my part of the world, and, and to an extent I think it's a problem here as well, is that uh, the society becomes more and more fragmented, and, uh, and in particular the political sphere becomes fragmented, and that uh, 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 there seems to be a, a lack of ability to debate and speak across party lines, ideological lines, uh, uh, ethnic lines, and, uh, mm, and so on and so forth. And, and one of the things that mm, Aspen and the, the Aspen model that started here in the United States is great about is that it provides a, a meeting space for people with diverse uh, views and uh, diverse approaches, and not just politicians, but it brings together politicians with uh, actors, with musicians, with high-tech entrepreneurs, with uh, lawyers, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so it enables people also to speak across professional lines, and uh, and. Uh, and it's it's a very slow process, but uh, of course the hope is that, uh, and the at the end the uh, people can become less isolated and uh, and less uh, uh, prone to think only about their personal uh, priorities and uh, uh, and be able to to engage in in solving issues as. Uh, as a group, and that has to do with uh, the other part of the Aspen methodology, uh, which is uh, which is the leadership program and 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 a conscious effort to to educate young leaders uh, who are uh, <coughs> not yet as spoiled and rotten as the rest of us are, and uh, uh, and so so that's why. I do devote, uh, you know, part of my time and energy to to, to to Aspen, and 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 I think it's a great model. Uh, I think there are two final questions uh, down here. Uh, why don't we have both questions, and then you can answer. Uh, Tom Dine here in the front row, and then the gentleman in the second row. Mm -hmm. Well, Wendy asked my question. <laughs> She even used words I was going to use and ask a another question and references <laughs> <laughs> and references to Hungary. Uh, to me, Hungary is is uh, an exception, and I hope it doesn't prove the rule. My only uh, comment to Michael, and it was a brilliant lecture. Thank you. Is maybe the next one is the certainty of authoritarian rule, because as we've experienced in our own lifetime. Uh, and you use the word tyranny, you reference to your children. Uh, those who don't love uncertainty and freedom, and you called it the uh, precondition of freedom, uh, that means they must love certainty and how corrosive certainty is in, in our existence. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the gentleman in the second row. Um, Michael, I um, have to say that about two thirds through your comments, I was thinking of your friend Milos's film, Milos Forman's film, um, Amadeus, when Mozart is on his deathbed, and he's, um, you know, composing in his mind, and he's saying it very, you know, reading it out from his head into Sal to uh, Salieri, I think was his name. Salieri. And, yes. uh, and at a certain point, he just looked at Mozart and said, "Stop! Stop! You're going too fast. You've got to slow down." <laughs> It was really brilliant and dense with insight and observation, and we are all enriched by it, and thank you. Um, the question, uh, I wanted to pick up on something you just made a quick reference to on the first half of your comments, and where you're talking about the, you know, the threats to um, self-governance self and democracy and freedom and so forth. 
and you mentioned is one of the you know one of the saving graces is the self-correcting quality of it, and I'm wondering, and it kind of picks up on a comment you just made in reference to or, or in response to uh, Wendy a moment ago. And what are the dangers do, that do you see dangers on the horizon, or not so much on the horizon, very much in the presence, with respect to the self govern sorry self correcting mechanisms that we have here, uh, well in these in our so called free societies. I shouldn't say so called in our free societies. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, Jim, I, you know, I'm, um, I'm a great admirer of this country and I, I, I try to follow what's, uh, uh, what's going on, albeit from, from a distance and, and I, as anyone else, I think I see some uh, disturbing signs uh, as, uh, 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 as I see back home or, or, or all over Europe, but I, I don't see an imminent, uh, you know, danger to the self-correcting uh, capability. I think I think issues that I see issues that have to be addressed, but 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 uh, nothing that could not be uh, repaired or, or, or corrected. I think, uh, you know, the democracy in this country is too strong for that. That's that's my conviction anyway. <coughs> you want to comment on Tom's? Yeah. Well, you know, I. It's it's a it's a bit controversial uh, what I'm going to say, and uh, 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 because you know I hear so many people concerned about uh, about Hungary and what's what's going on in there, and uh, and uh, and referring back to the Aspen Institute, we what what we do is not just a check thing. You know what we try to do is a reinforcing. We working with uh, with uh, young leaders in Slovakia, in Hungary, in Poland, and uh, and we we try to do things uh, mm, things together on the regional uh, uh, basis. And and of course, I speak to my counterpart, Hungarian counterpart in London a lot. And and uh, and look, there are things going on in Hungary that I would be, and you would be, and you are very uneasy about there's no question about that but that said you know we we've been through periods like that with other countries you will remember that uh, what is it 15 years ago or 10 years ago 10 years ago we had this phase in austria with uh, with the freedom party uh, there some of the same signs some of the disturbing same disturbing signs, and uh, and and I'm happy to say that you know Austria uh, survived uh, just nicely, and uh, and that uh, you know one aspect of it that I was not very happy about at that time uh, were your attempts to ostracize Austria as uh, you know a. Uh, an infected patient, like you know, all the rest of us were, were, were perfect, and that's not really the case. Mm. I see uh, smaller signs of what is happening in in Hungary. I see in other countries as well, and and I I I always believe that uh, that you know you should start from uh, your own. Uh, threshold from your own door and 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 work out the tragedy of Hungary was that they had an election in which one party won more than fifty percent of uh, of uh, of the vote uh, well you know it's it it created certainly created problem but it's there's nothing uh, Intrinsically undemocratic about that. I mean, that's what the that's what the people voted for, and and as long as there will be another election two years down the line or one year down the line, I think there are uh, chances for the Hungarians to say what they, uh, you know, that they they perhaps don't want to continue along the same lines and and want to make a a, a correction, yeah. But I. I 
I'm not ready to say that the uh, I'm not ready to say at this point that the democracy in Hungary is doomed. Yeah. Let's all thank Ambassador uh, Zandowski. Um, uh, one, one last commercial. You're always welcome at the Wilson Center, and I hope you will come back. We have one uh, last part of, uh, of this event, and I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador Ted Russell and Tom Dine and Bill Tucker to come forward, I believe. Ganging up on me. They're ganging up on you. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Kasich, sorry, I missed one. That's right. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take the mic first. Uh, as the president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, we are thrilled that we co-sponsor this event every year with the Friends of Slovak Slovakia. And we've heard some profound remarks from this podium uh, on an annual basis. But Michael, this really topped it. This really, this really topped it today, and I was thrilled uh, listening to you. And we've got to have a copy of what you just said before you get on an airplane <laughs> to go home. So I'm going to ask uh, the Wilson Center to Xerox quickly, <laughs> if you would. Oh, you'll, you'll get a digital copy. A digital copy, okay. I forgot what era I live in. <laughs> uh, so on behalf of the American Friends and Ted will speak upon uh, about the, the Friends of Slovakia, the American Friends of the Czech Republic. Uh, I'm happy to give you a certificate, which is worth thousands. Uh, uh, and, and, and Ted and I are going to present this to you, and we can get a, a – oh, you signed it. I'm sorry. Yes. Bill. 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 Where is that? Where are the cameras? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go. That's better. You are bold. There's nothing uncertain about you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all. Come back. <laughs> we, we know you will do. One more thing. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to echo what's been said by a number of people. Uh, that was one of the most profound meditations on freedom that I've heard in, in some time. It was marvelous. And Michael, we want to thank you so much for keeping alive the spirit of the Velvet Revolution of keeping alive the spirit of the transatlantic partnership, working very hard to do that. And Friends of Slovakia, uh, therefore, would like to present you with our Medal of Honor, uh, which has uh, the bust of General Milan Rastislav Stefanik on it, a soldier, statesman, and diplomat, whose motto was, nothing is impossible. I think you have lived that. And I'd like you to accept this, please, uh, from Friends of Slovakia. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>